I'm from Smith. Uh, anyway, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Viking ship building. Um, just a note on the, the pictures here on the uh, um, on this first slide. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the ship there on the upper left is actually at the uh, Viking Shipbuilding Museum in Roskilde, Denmark. Uh, I love that place. I've been there a couple of times. Um, that one is called the Sea Stallion. Uh, it is a replica that they actually take out on a number of voyages there uh, on the Roskilde, uh, Roskilde Ford and then uh, into the North Sea. Um, you'll also notice the teepees behind it. Um, the, what we normally think of as the Viking A-frame tent is actually an interpretation from a structure found in the Gokstad ship from Norway, um, but there's not really any evidence that that was ever actually used as a tent um, beyond its use in that burial. And it is, seems to be kind of the common wisdom there, at least among the Danes, that uh, what they would do is stack all the oars and then throw the sail over top of it, much like a teepee, uh, especially given that the word sail is actually the same as the word for protection, sail, and tent. Um, the, uh, the ship there on the lower right is the Harald Harfagra, uh, which was uh, built by the Norwegian government. Uh, it is there at Mystic Seaport in Connecticut. I went up there about three years ago for a, uh, um, for a class on Viking shipbuilding, um, and she had come across the North Atlantic. I had actually almost signed on to crew her across the North Atlantic um, and was wintering over in Mystic for some repairs. Uh, like any ocean going back, so she's actually got uh, engines and a rudder, and full communications and radar and whatnot. Uh, but she's actually fairly large. Um, you can't see from that photo, she's roughly the same size as an 1840s era whaling ship that was parked right next to her. Um, her, her beam is probably about 30 feet. Um, so she's, she's fairly, uh, fairly magnificent. Um, okay, so types of ships. Uh, there are a number of different types of ships based on their use. Uh, the smallest is called a ferry. Um, these boats are actually still built more or less the same way in the Pharaohs, which is where the name comes from. Uh, there were a number of these smaller boats that were found uh, on board the uh, Gokstad and Teen ships in Norway. Um, they're between four and six meters long. Um, they can actually use a sail as well. And then the next one is a beer thing, which is a small cargo ship. Uh, and then a snow, which is a larger cargo ship. Um, then uh, there is the escape, which is a small uh, warship. And then there is a uh, snecker or a drecker, which is a snake ship or a dragon ship, uh, which are the larger warships. Um, You'll see the numbers there, the Skuldelev. Skuldelev is uh, uh, a waterway uh, just north of Roskilde, where six ships were intentionally sunk sometime in the 13th century as a way of blocking the harbor. And uh, they were actually all Viking ships. So they were extremely well preserved, and they are a source of a significant amount of our knowledge of how ships were built um, as they were, uh, um, they were raised in the 1950s. And, and the museum was basically built around those finds. Um, on the right there is uh, uh, some of the terms uh, that are actually still used in, to a certain ex uh, extent um, in, in modern, uh, modern um, sailing. Uh, the uh, halyard is part of the running rigging. It's the thing that allows you to raise the sail. The stays are the fore and aft standing rigging that hold the mast up, and the shrouds are the lateral rigging that holds the mast up. Um, the top of the, the sides of the sail is known as the luff. Um, the um, uh, little strings that you see on the sail are called reef points, and those are used to tie up the sail in higher winds so that you don't flip over. Um, the, uh, the, the steers board or the star, starboard is steering board or rudder. You'll see there's off to the right. The interesting thing about this is because it's so far off the center line, it can actually be fairly small and still turn the ship pretty well because you have such a larger moment arm than you have with a rudder. So with a rudder, you know, that 12, 12 inches wide, the moment arm is only about six inches thick off the center line. This thing is almost five feet off the center line. 
So it, uh, it, it can actually impart a pretty good twist on the ship. The last thing, uh, uh, hopefully you can see it's behind my cameras, is the, the Batias or the Tactol. This is somewhat conjectural. Again, these boats were still made more or less the same way until the 14th century. And uh, they would take this pole, they would connect to the lower corner or the, what's called the clutac of the, uh, of the sail and, and be able to hold it out um, across the wind um, over, over the side. And with this, they were able to actually tack uh, on, a, on a broad reach. Um, which is uh, generally not possible to do without a daggerboard looking sailed ship. Uh, modern sailing ships can actually go pretty far into the wind. So if your wind is directly behind you, it's called running. If the wind is uh, anywhere to about um, 45 degrees off of either side, it's called a broad reach. If it's between 45 and 135 degrees of um, your uh, right off your beam, it's called a beam reach. And if it's in front of you on either side um, to about 30 degrees off of directly in front of you, it's called a narrow reach. And then in front of you, no ship is possible of running against the wind. And that's called being in iron because you would typically have a uh, little triangular piece of iron at the top of a 18th, 17th, 18th century sailing ship to show that the the wind had had moved into an unfavorable location, and that's why it's called being in iron. But again, those terms actually originate in, in large part from the Viking Age and are still used today. So there's a lot that goes into building a ship. Um, a summary of some of the major processes and industries that are required. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of wood, so there's trees, uh, there's carpentry skill. There's also an awful lot of charcoal and pine tar creation. In fact, to make one of those 20 venture ships like the, uh, uh, like the Sea Serpent there, required 95 cords of wood just to turn into charcoal, just to make the iron nails, the fittings, and to do the steam bending for the wood. That's a lot of wood. Um, that's about 30 truckload falls of wood in order, to, in order to make all that charcoal. So, with the wood, you get about a one to four ratio. So when you, when you cut the wood down and you let it dry out, it loses about, uh, about half of its weight um, in water. And then when you burn it to turn it to charcoal, it loses half again of its weight in the things that are not carbon. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of how much wood this actually takes. And that would be generally done with oak. And then pine tar, uh, which is ba basically the same way and always has been, um, is kind of the, uh, the resin mixed with the turpentine um, by, 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 by baking the pine, and that's used for preservation of the underside of the hull, waterproofing, as well as mixing with linen or wool fragments to make caulking for each of the boards. Um, for those of you who are Foxfire uh, University fans, uh, Foxfire 5 and Foxfire 9 have some pretty good articles on how to make charcoal, how to make pine tar, how to steam bent boards, um, and, and pretty much all the techniques that were used in the 19th century Appalachia are the same as the techniques that were used here. Most of the iron came from bog iron. Um, this is kind of a red clay rock that you find in the bottom of certain swamps. Unfortunately, there is both a geologic and a biologic activity that is required to, to render the hydrogen uh, sorry, the iron sulfide out of swamp water into the limestone. And even though we have hydrogen sulfide in the water and limestone here in Florida, we have absolutely no bog iron because it's too hot for the right bacteria to grow. And in fact, um, you don't find much of it in the United States, much south of North Carolina, although there was a fairly significant industry in the 1780s, 1790s, and early 1800s rendering bog iron in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, New York and so on and so forth. And that's why there was such a large ironworks as well as uh, gunsmithing um, industry up there at the beginning of the country. Then of course, there's, uh, there's the smelting that iron down. That is also about a, um, uh, a, a, a one to four ratio between the, the raw bog iron, then you roast it to get all the water out and then you smelt it down. Um, you'll get about one pound of iron for every four pounds of raw or that you started with. Um, then forging that into the nails and the other binding strips, and also the making of tools. 
there's also a significant portion of animal husbandry that goes along with it. The limiting factor, both in terms of time, man hours, and land for, required in order to be able to run a boat building business, is sheep. It, it takes about 265 sheep in one summer to make enough wool to make a sale for a 20 venture. That requires about uh, 45 acres of, of um, uh, grazing land. Uh, cows are useful um, uh, because the tallow is used as well as the horse fat is used to, uh, to waterproof the sails. Um, and the horses, of course, are required to drag all those trees uh, uh, to, from wherever you're selling them to the location where you're building the boat. And then pigs, not only for feeding the crew, but also for the, uh, the lard um, for uh, greasing the ropes and helping them move through the, through the running rigging and so on and so forth. And as we talked about, textiles are the really big um, 800 pound girl in the room. Approximately half of the work of building a Viking warship is making yarn for the sails. Then of course it has to be weaved and sewn into sails and then, and then obscured or, uh, or dressed using a combination of horse fat, tallow, water, and ochre. Um, storage and fabrication, uh, you need access to retting fields, which are marshy lands um, that have a lot of uh, moisture that can be used to rot the, uh, the bark and the bast away from, from oak in order to make ropes. Um, they can also be used for linen, although we don't know that there were any used linen sales or anything like that, but certainly linen was known, at least in Norway, although it wasn't used much in the flax will grow in the south of, of sorry, of, of Norway. Oh, flax will grow in the south of Norway. The Nals is the, the low open building that's used as the shipyard. Um, grasslands and mast is for feeding your sheep and pigs. The Ozus, or firehouse is your uh, kitchen slash um, uh, forge. And then a fiber barn for spinning all that, uh, that wool because that, like I said, was a fairly significant operation. Uh, the rigging itself, uh, a lot of the ropes would be made out of lime or oak bast. That's the, uh, the thin papery layer that is between the woody um, part of, of a tree and the outer uh, coarse bark. Skin and hide in particular was steel skin was used for the standing rigging. Um, hair is also common for, for spinning uh, smaller ropes, small stuff, um, oakum, things like that. And then withies, uh, which are, uh, uh, for any of those who are really old in Southern, remember when your father told you to cut a switch from the willow in the backyard? Well, that's what a withy is. Those were used for tying off the, uh, uh, the oars and the, for making little uh, um, bowl covers for the oar holes, as well as tying the rudder to the, the large knob on the back of the hull uh, that held it in place. And then of course the caulking, which a lot of that was old linen or old wool clothing or, or wool left over mixed with pine tar. And that was laid into all of the uh, things between the, um, the boards. So this is a couple of pictures from that uh, uh, shipbuilding class I went to at Mystic. These are the trees that we started with. Um, these are uh, white oak that had been left in the water for some time, and that was actually fairly common. You wanted to cut it at the end of winter before the spring, before the sap came up. Um, a, a, a note, white oak doesn't generally grow in Florida, and it generally doesn't grow south of about Savannah in the United States. You really want to use white oak. You can't really use red oak because it is, it's actually not very good in water. And you can't use the laurel oaks uh, that we find here in Florida, uh, because you, if you'll see that oak there in the foreground, you'll see how that smaller discoloration in the center, that's the pit. And that is where the sap rises through. Um, in white oak, that's actually relatively small. It's not terribly useful for a portion of the board. You end up carving it away. In a laurel oak, that's actually about half of the, the width of the oak, um, which does two things. One, that's why laurel oaks tend to have the hearts rot out after about 70 years and they fall over. And two, it's rock hard. Um, and I think I have some pictures in here, uh, or I have some pictures on my Facebook. I might have to share those in a bit. 
um, of uh, lower oak that I tried to split and see if I could make into boards, and it doesn't really work. But it was an interesting experiment to try. So you can see here, this is we actually just started with uh, hammers and wood wedges and spent about two days just splitting the boards down into eighths. You can see here, starting with the end, you really just actually put a score mark in it with a hatchet, and then you just start tapping away until you can split it. Um, I said that I did the same thing here with a log about six feet long and about uh, 14 inches wide. It took me about three days to split it down into eight. Here's an example of a, uh, of a much larger board. This is typical of the boards that are used for the strikes, which are the boards along the hull, um, typically about two and a half to three feet wide. Um, and Denmark is lucky in that there was a stand of these things planted like 500 years ago for the, for the king, and it basically was untouched until modern times. So they actually have a pretty steady supply of some really excellent oaks in order to build this stuff. Um, here's another picture of the splits that we did in our class. You can see the eighths over here to the right. This is what you're getting to, is these eighths. The other thing about the laurel oak is it tends to grow in a spiral just like pine does. You have to follow the grain. So it ends up limiting the number of functional boards that you can get out of a log. It says, you, if for one of those three foot logs, you would actually split that into 30 seconds and get 32 good planks out of it. With, the, um, with this, because these logs are a little smaller, we were only able to get to eight. So here's the process of making a plank. This is what we did inside. Um, you can see here where we're notching it. So you start out with a, with a triangular section and then you want to, Take one of the faces is going to be almost entirely perpendicular to the grain, right? which is not exactly the same thing as quarter sawn, which you can buy quarter sawn oak. Um, but uh, basically, one out of every three quarter sawn planks will actually be completely parallel or perpendicular to the grain. The other two, not entirely so. So if, if, if the question is, can I skip out on all this process and just make it with modern sawn longs? The answer is, you can, I kind of, sort of can. But it tends to be very expensive because you're getting quarter sawn oak and then you can only use one out of every three of them. When you do it this way though, you can observe the log and cut away the parts that are the wrong part for how you want to cut the log as opposed to just whatever the sawmill does. And you do that by putting in these notches that get you down to depth and then carving away the rest of it using a broad axe. And you can kind of see here on the right, that was my, my personal plank, where it kind of in the middle of that log. I had already chipped away a section of it. So a broad axe actually has a blade or a handle that is off angle from the, from the, from the handle. It looks a little funky when you look at it, but the reason is that it allows you to hack away at the wood without tearing your knuckles up on the sides of the board. So here's some examples of those tools. On the left here are, are, are some example broad axes. So the ones in the foreground here are more period style. The ones in the and the, uh, in the background there are the modern ones. Um, I have one of these, it's a fantastic axe, it wasn't cheap, it's from a special company in Sweden that makes them, but you can see how the, ang the blade is angled. Here's one where you can really see how off angle the handle is. The next thing over is a scraper. This thing is used for digging out the, the dados in the, um, uh, uh, the backs of boards that are used to fit the caulking as well as to push the caulking in, as well as doing some decorative clips on the front side. Up on the right there, you see a number of other types of axes. You end up having to get very specialized axes for this because most axes in America are really for felling trees and they're actually a tad too thick and they will end up splitting the wood. Um, and most of the combat axes that you buy as replicas are actually too thin because they're really designed around splitting skulls. So uh, I have a, that same Swedish company makes a nice set. I, I, got, I picked up one from one of those axe burning places up north. Um, that had the right type of blade for actually doing the work that you need to do with uh, cutting those notches in the boards. And let me tell you, having the right axe actually makes all the difference in the world. Um, up there in the upper right-hand corner there are period axes, so where you can buy modern ones as well. And those are used for carving out the stem and stone pieces. Down here at the bottom, you see these auger bits. Um, these things actually make pretty good quick work of the boards. And these are used for drilling the holes that the nails go in. Uh, block planes, which are basically unaltered for over a thousand years, and then a bow drill, uh, which is here. This is actually used for drilling a smaller hole. So the main portion of the boat, the actual significant contribution to 
naval architecture that the Vikings made was the keel. Uh, the keel itself uh, was made out of uh, one very long piece that's more or less T-shaped in the center to tapering to a rectangle at the ends and then cut off at a very shallow angle known as a kerf um, with the stem and stern pieces built in one piece that were curved into it and then built up with rivets. Now, you look at that, and in and of itself, it looks splendid as hell. But with the, the strength that's imposed by all those carved boards, it's actually fairly substantial. The piece that you're seeing here, the keelson, goes over top of the ribs inside of the boat. And this is the thing that takes the weight of the mast and distributes it across the inside of the ship. Now, one of the keys on how old the Viking ship is is how long this thing is. Because in the beginning, they thought, oh my God, we need to make this thing huge to spread the weight out. And over time, they realized, ah, it's not quite so bad. So, so a, a very early 9th century ship is going to have a keelson that will probably go two thirds to three quarters of the length of the boat. Whereas uh, a more modern one, modern meaning 10th, 11th century, may only go across three ribs on either side of the map. So here you can see a replica of the Skull of Three being uh, built in the shipyard. This was uh, um, this here. The bottom was when I was there two years ago, and the one at the top when I was there five years ago. So you can see this is a bit of a labor of love. They've been kind of working slowly at it, but they're, they're building all these strakes and, uh, um, and steaming them up. They have also been treated with a combination of linseed oil and pine pitch to uh, keep the moisture in the boards so they don't warp while the ship is being built. Um, now that is a sort of a, a modern affectation. The interesting thing about these is that the ship had to be built inside of six months. It didn't matter if it was a four person boat or a 40 person boat. So the number of people that you had to have to build a boat, of course, varied depending on how the boat, the boat was. So what this tells you is that you actually had a very um, transient workforce. You might have, a core group of three or four people, the ship, the, the shipmaster, and so on and so forth, who are the standing part of the business. But as many as 20 to 25 people might be required to do all the labor of building a, a 20 venture, but they're all, they're not going to be permanent workers because they're really only working for that six month period. Here's some details. You can see the nails um, as they were uh, uh, laid into the boat. Uh, here it, on the middle, almost of the this third row down, you can see what's called a rove. That's the washer that is actually on the back of all these all these other nails. And for whatever reason, this one was uh, was done opposite. And then uh, a little bit over to the left of that, you can also see these two wooden knobs. Those are made out of willow poplar or lemon wood, and those are called trunnels or tree nails. And those are specific for keeping in the ribs. The ribs were not metal nailed to the boat. The ribs were laid into the boat and then fixed into place with these trunnels later. So the thing about the ship construction is that it's called clinker built. And so far as the hull is where all the strength and the rigidity comes from, not the ribs. The ribs are just there to give it a little bit more form keeping after the hull has actually been built up to keep the shape. On the right-hand side here, you can see how that stem piece is fairly substantial log and that the last Sweeping bits there are actually uh, carved into it in shape. It's all one piece. The other thing that's interesting thing about this is that you would not think that keeping the, the bever of those last boards facing this direction would be watertight, but it actually is. And it's fairly universal that this is the direction in which the curves to that last break have been made it into the stem and stern piece. The top here, you can see one last plank being put into place as it has just been steamed. It hasn't been coated at all yet. But the interesting thing here is you can see in these boards, this is all oak, and you can see this kind of wavy lines. These are called ray flex, and that's how you know that this is a very quarter, that this is quarter sawn oak, or quarter cut oak, um, that is directly across the grain. Here's another detail of the inside. You can kind of see that last rib piece. Um, you can see the trunnels here on the back. You can see how they were split and wedged into place. So th that's how they, they're, they're actually just friction fit into the ship. Um, so again, these pieces are cut up after the fact. You can also get a good detail here of all these rows. Uh, a lot of them nowadays are made out of copper. 
Um, the, the iron in period tended to be actual uh, wrought iron, which is very high in silicate. And that silicate makes it uh, um, pretty uh, um, uh, corrosion resistant. Kind of hard to find that in the modern day. Um, so uh, because of that, we tend to use copper because it, it holds up better. Um, it also tends to retard marine growth on the hull. Um, so it's, it's part of the preservation of the, uh, of the ship over time. So <clears throat> we talked a little bit about the Gorkstad ship. Here's a picture of it. This is actually my picture, uh, having visited that museum last year. Um, this is one of the, the two probably finest uh, uh, finds that there are. Um, unfortunately, uh, this, this was found back in the 1930s. And at the time, the only preservation technique they had was to soak the boards in ammonium alum. Um, and that is actually starting to break down. Um, so the museum is actually looking for some, uh, some advice on how to keep the ship from sagging. You can see all those metal brackets there that were added to keep the hull from uh, sagging under its own weight. Um, and that, that piece underneath the keel there that was put in place to, to kind of keep it in shape. And that's all, those are actually all fairly new. Um, the uh, uh, modern uh, technique for preservation of wood is to impregnate it with polyethylene glycol, uh, which is the waxy uh, preservative that's used in Thompson water seal. Uh, here is uh, an original stem piece from the Skildalev 3 um, that is in the, uh, the Skildalev IT Ship Museum. Um, that's a much smaller boat, so you can see here that stem piece, of course, is, is also much smaller. Uh, I believe this is the Skildalev 2, which is the large gnar. Um, this is actually what's left of it. Uh, you can see here in the museum with the ribs and the pieces that are, uh, um, that are around. Um, so as I said, pine tar, um, that's really just about bunch of burying a bunch of pine logs, starting a fire at keeping it, uh, the air out so it doesn't burn too fiercely, and then collecting the, the melted resin and turpentine that comes off of it. Uh, bog iron, there's two basic ores, limonite and goethite, and it is the Fe203 type iron, uh, which is, this is rust, um, so that's why it's got that rusty color. Uh, here's an example of, of, of uh, um, limonite in the, uh, 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 that has been pulled out of the ground there on the right. So the iron processing, of course, you had to do the collection and transport, uh, the roasting, uh, where you just basically cook it over an open fire to get out all the um, hydrates, uh, smelting, uh, where you're burning a very hot fire in a, in a funnel um, uh, with a tulare, which is a pipe that's used to blow air into it. So it's almost, almost like a blast furnace, although the air would be basically coming from the wind or from a bellows, not from a, from a forced air. Um, and you get a very hot fire and put all that ore in there and you get the, the iron will fall to the bottom and then all the silicates and slags will float to the top. So when you bust open the mound, you can pull the iron off out of the bottom and crack that uh, impurity portion off the top. Then of course, you're going to hammer it and forge it into the things that you need it to be. So here's some examples of what those uh, um, uh, smelting rigs look like. Uh, on the right here is a picture of, an, of a period anvil from the uh, blacksmith shop at the uh, Hedeby Museum. And here is the black shopsmith uh, uh, in the Hedeby Museum. You can see the, the blacksmith tools up here on the right. The dual bellows with some a soapstone um, furnace back and a um, uh, and a and a, and a little uh, fire pit here. I might point out that these are actually extraordinarily easy to make. Um, it's about thirty dollars in materials. You just take a couple of two by sixes from Home Depot, get some um, uh, uh, cement and mix it with too much sand, like you were doing a shower job, and fill that box about two thirds of the way. You kind of dig yourself out a little bit of a hole. Fill the rest of it with just sandbox sand. Put some kind of a, a, a brick um, on the back here to keep the, from burning up your motor, and you can go to town. Um, I actually uh, built a number of these forges. I said they're they're so cheap. It's, it's almost like okay, it's, you know, it's too much trouble to store. I'll just get rid of it and get another and build another one when I need it. Um, so it's actually kind of fun. Obviously, it's you know fire, so be careful. But uh, but it's kind of fun to to get right into it. It's, it's extremely accessible. Uh, so this is another picture of the Elkhus hair. You can see this very large bellows system here. Uh, interesting to me, you never read about it, but it's 
completely ubiquitous is that, is that these things are all A indoors, and then they have a leather covering over the top to catch sparks from uh, setting the roof on fire. And it seems like that uh, everywhere has that, so it's probably pretty accurate to uh, what, what, what they may have done. Um, getting into the animals, uh, we talked about the seals. Yes, they're cute, but they did use the skin for spank clothing and spank rigging. Cheap for the wool sales. Uh, cows for milk and tallow, pigs for lard and food, horses for tallow, sinew for food and transportation. Uh, it is interesting that the period sources tell you that pig sinew is terrible for making rope, but horse sinew is pretty good. As you would expect, horses run a lot faster than pigs. Ah, so textile creation. Obviously, weaving is a big part of this. this is actually a picture of the loom from the Muskoka Museum. Um, they used a two and two weave, uh, and I have a picture of some examples of that here in a second. This is uh, some handmade wool that I had a friend of mine make. So the, the two and two weave is here on the right. Um, uh, uh, this is the lower left-hand corner of this picture. This on the left is a one and one, so you can kind of see the contrast. Um, oops. So uh, here in the middle, I unfortunately didn't have enough time to finish this. I was kind of hoping to, but I didn't get to it. I, I got some suet from the local butcher and reducing that down to beef tallow. And that would be, so you would take the cloth and wet it, and then you would take this reduced tallow, heat it back up again until it turns into oil, and you would mix either yellow ochre or red ochre, and the only difference between them is how long you cook them, um, but it is otherwise uh, uh, dug up out of the ground. It's the same thing as the um, bog iron. Um, and that helps bind as a clay the oils to the sailcloth, and it, it is amazing how much of a difference it makes in terms of its durability and its air permeability. Uh, over here on the right is a drop spindle and some raw wool. You would pull this wool off into, into strands that you would wrap around a, a, a distaff, which is just another stick, and then you would use the drop spindle to twist it into the yarn, and then you might take a, a kind of an H-shaped thing called a nitty knotty to wrap the yarn around it as you were making it. And rather rinse repeat. Like I said, only women are fire clay. Um, here are some drop spinner rolls. Uh, similarly made on um, fire clay. These are actually much smaller. I was actually amazed. Seeing how large and heavy the weights that we typically use today um, on drug spills, the period ones are actually very small. It doesn't actually take very much um, to, to, to impart that, that rotational momentum. Here's an example of a, um, uh, of a witty band uh, that holds the, uh, uh, the rudder of the Osberger ship to, its, uh, to the hull. Um, here's a picture of some line bass. There's pretty cool. Uh, Sail loft here at the Riscilla ship where they're constantly making uh, ropes out of the uh, period materials. Um, here's an example of a redding field. Um, so this, this is actually linen, but you get the idea. So you basically just lay it out on this wet, marshy land, and the moisture and the heat will, uh, and bacterial action will, uh, um, uh, will float away. Of course, it smells horrible, so you want to make sure it's downwind with the rest of your, uh, of your facility. Here's a, here's a cord uh shop at uh, Riscilla. So you can see here, they have everything from wax linen, to bath, to steel skin, to horse sinew, and they're making all kinds of different ropes out of it. Here's a picture of such some steel skin, uh, uh, steel hide rope as an example. Uh, let's see, this is a detail of the mast fish of a very small boat. This is about a 20-footer. As you can see here, it's actually, it's not fairly significant as the, those earlier ones. Um, this is a replica of one of the fairings uh, that was brought over with a held Hartaga. Um, here's some rigging and, uh, rigging and fit out details. You can see this piece here used to tighten the standing rigging on the right. Um, you can see the halyard that's used to raise the sail on the mast here on both. Um, and you can see these things that are called cleats, and that's actually the northward board as well, um, that are used to tie off lines. Uh, it's kind of a little figure eight twisty knot that if you're ever going to do anything serious with boats, you want to learn because you need to be able to fight really fast. Uh, here's an example of an anchor that was in the, um, uh, the Osberg Museum. Um, it's just kind of a stone with some iron pieces. Um, 
is a detail of an ore, uh, which is called a thole. Um, so it's got these little covers that will uh, keep the water from rushing in. But you would sit on a bench here in between the ribs, and this is called a room or room um, uh, or place. Um, and then you would slide the ore out through that hole um, and, uh, and, and row the, uh, the ship. The, the ores were, even though the ship itself were largely made out of oak, the ores, the ores themselves were made out of pine or Douglas fir. Here's some detail on the carvings on the Harold Fogger. This is actually the same motif that is on the Elseberg ship. This is, uh, it's, it's probably never intended as an ocean going vessel, but it's pretty pimping. Um, so it's considered to be uh, the burial place of a very high status person, potentially a figure from the uh, 8th century known as Queen Elsa. Um, this is an uh, example of a, a wind vane. There's about a dozen of these things that are at some you know, lesser or greater uh, levels of repair um, that have been found on a number of ships. This is a replica, but as you can see here in the, uh, um, the uh, Ringer Reich style of Viking art, um, these things are at the top of the mast to help you identify the wind and make sure that you don't go, quote unquote, in iron. Okay, that's my thing. Are there any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. We still have people in here. All right, well, you might get nine minutes, nine minutes of your life back. Maybe. <laughs> um, just to tell everybody before they sign off, there is the Fireside chat, I think, to wrap everything up. Um, it's in the Fireside chat room. I can post the link over there in a minute. And that's going on until 5 o'clock. Let me grab that link. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for teaching class. Yeah.